Welcome back to, uh, welcome in to uh, Brainstorming America. I forgot who I was and where I was, but uh, we appreciate you tuning in today. And I hope we got some stuff that you're gonna really like. It's um, information that you've probably seen some bits and pieces of. We're gonna dive deep into it. Here with John Merrill. John, good to see you, brother. Thank you, my brother. Good Always good to be with you. There you go. Because um, we know when we're together, there's stuff happening, but Let's talk about some and things. Some that, of it's good. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about some things that the people are aware of and may not be aware of. Uh, I don't know. Well, you and I haven't talked about this, but the state of Michigan voted to allow federal and state agencies to set up voter registration agencies. You aware of that? I am, and this discussion is something that has really been very interesting to me, Ken, because several months ago, the president issued an executive order talking about enabling federal agencies to register people to vote, actually designating employees that work for those particular agencies to be assigned to register people to vote, whether it's Department of Human Resources, whether it's Medicaid, all the things that are related to governmental functions. Now, there are many people who don't think that that's appropriate. I'm one of them. I think that there are certain outlets where you should encourage people to register to vote. As a matter of fact, the Voting Rights Act of 1993 actually indicates that all federal agencies at every level in every state in the union, in every jurisdiction in that state, is charged with making voter registration forms available to people who come for services that are rendered by those agencies. But not to designate an official in each one of those agencies to be responsible for registering people to vote. I mean, what else are you gonna do? That's not your job. If your job is with DHR, then you're supposed to meet the needs of the clients that come there. If your job's with Medicaid, you're supposed to meet the needs of the client that come there. But you're not supposed to be registering people to vote. That is a local action taking place by the Board of Registrars in each one of those local jurisdictions in Alabama in our 67 counties, in California in their 67 counties, in Pennsylvania in their 67 counties, in Nevada in their 17 counties, in Arizona in their 16 counties, in Georgia in the 159 counties. But it's not a federal requirement. So Michigan decided that they would approve legislation indicating that that's what their responsibilities are. This is part of that woke environment that we're talking about that is actually a problem. As I said before, the Voting Rights Act of 1993 encourages and requires by law that those federal agencies provide the opportunity for people to become registered voters in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. We want to encourage people to become registered voters. If they are U.S. citizens, reside in the state of that local jurisdiction, that they become registered voters if they're not disqualified for reasons that are indicated by law in that particular state, so then they can participate in the electoral process at the level that they want to, period. I had a question in my mind, and I'm, a, I'm an amateur in that because you used to be the Secretary of State, you know. The, uh, the thing that I questioned was, okay, you got Social Security office, a federal agency, you got people that are in charge of overseeing, handing out uh, voting uh, voter registration. Voter registration. Now, would that be in everybody's uh, job description, or would it be an individual that that's their sole position? Or if you had one as dual, that was supposed to take care of the people for their Social Security. And they said, well, we can't get to you right now. We're registering voters. This is election season. We can't take care of your Social Security. You have to come back tomorrow. How long does it take before? Because, Ken, what you just described would be a problem. Because that problem is not related to that agency's purpose. You want to make sure that an agency is doing the work that they're created to do not getting in someone else's lane. If I'm told to go to the Social Security office to register to vote, and I go to the Social Security office and they can't take care of me, somewhere along the line, somebody's gonna get a complaint 
that electoral process is flawed because they can't take care of the people to vote. You know, you you can vote anything you go to vote, and they say, oh, you can't go in there right now because we got a flock of birds out here. We got some ducks walking through. Any normal thing, that's a reason to file with your office. That's right. So now we're opening that up to say you're, you're to vote at DHR or it's federal or state offices. If you do that, somebody's got to hand out the pamphlet and show you how to fill it out and make sure it's filled out properly. That's going to let the other work go. I'm, I'm just saying, if they talking about doing this, and I've not seen any discussion about that, where who does the work if you're going to create an office, another office within an office, who's going to who's going to dealy out the money? That's right. Is it going to be create That's another right. position? That's exactly right. Because so, as an employee in that particular federal agency, that particular state agency, you have a charge. And it's to fulfill the mission of the entity for which you work. If you're doing anything other than that, you're not fulfilling the mission for the entity in which you work. And so you need to make sure that's your first priority, that's what you're doing to serve the public in that general way. And when you're doing that, then you're contributing to the greater good of that community in which you're assigned. And if you're not, you're wasting time and you're not doing what you need to do. And you need to be able to provide voter registration forms, but not to be their voter registration agent at those local locations that we're talking about. We'll see you back here for our third and final segment of the 67th episode of Brainstorm in America right after this break. Welcome back to the second segment. Uh, Brainstorming America, Ken Rollins here with John Merrill. And John, uh, some of the things I want to get covered in this, uh, so I'm just going to go right to them. The first thing is the woke DEI. Uh, for those folks that uh, don't know what's going on, that DEI hiring that, uh, that the Secret Service has. And, uh, and for the unanointed, Ken, diversity, equity, and inclusion mm -hmm. are the things that we're actually talking about here. And go ahead, because there's something else I want to address about okay. that. And they have, uh, that's requiring so many females, so many blacks, so many Hispanics, et cetera. Well, we saw that play out when Donald Trump was, uh, attempted to assassinate him. With the short people supposed to guard a big, tall man. And I think you told me that some of them were supposed to be working in some other part of Pennsylvania somewhere. So it may have your your things on DEI and a uh, government agency. It's a real problem, Ken, and it's a real problem because what we need is the most qualified people who are competent and capable of doing the work for which they're assigned. And for some reason, our government thinks that they need to put people in certain locations based on the population of that location, based on the population of the nation, whether it be because they're African American, whether it be because they're Mexican American, whether it be because they're male or female, uh, certain age requirements that people have to meet in certain areas. Uh, what I want when I'm looking for a physician, Ken, is I want the most qualified physician that's got the best training, who can do the best effort for me as a patient of that individual when I'm looking to receive medical attention. I don't want the best black doctor. I don't want the best white doctor. I don't want the best Mexican doctor. I want the best doctor. I want the one that's going to take care of me. It's the same thing on an engineer. I don't want the best black engineer to build that bridge. I don't want the best white engineer to build the bridge. The best Mexican engineer female, male, to build that bridge. I want the best engineer to build that bridge because I'm going to be traveling over the bridge. My children are going to be traveling over the bridge. I hope to have grandchildren one day. They'll be traveling over the bridge. I don't want somebody to say, I was able to get this done because I was the best qualified female black engineer to do the work, I want somebody to be able to do the work because they were the best engineer available at the time. 
you know, Ken, I thought all of this was solved in 1979 with the Alan Bakke decision when he was trying to gain admission to the University of California Law School and was denied access because there were other people let in that were not as capable as he was, that did not have as high MCAT scores as he had, the medical admission requirement, that did not have the greatest undergraduate degrees that he possessed or the greatest scores on his undergraduate test. And he sued and was allowed to go to the University of California Berkeley School of Medicine. But what we have seen is a further deterioration of that over the last 40 plus years, and it's time for it to cease and desist. Absolutely, amen. Um, I'm gonna gotta cover some things here so we don't forget. First of all, I wanna, you just got back, we touched on some of the convention. Um, I, I just made myself a note. You were there for all, of, every time I turned TV on, I saw you, so I know you're there for a lot of it. Yes, sir. What, I was, I was there you? for all of it. You was right on the front and the front. What was your overall thoughts? Have you time, had time to assess in your mind? I, I mean, what was your thoughts of that convention period? Well, I thought it was great. Uh, as, as I had mentioned to you before, I don't think there's any convention in modern times that compares to that one since they've been televised going back to uh, Dwight Eisenhower in 1952. And I've seen all of the conventions since they began televising them. One of the things that C-SPAN does, Cable Satellite Public Affairs mm -hmm. Network does every time we get ready to have conventions, is they show the old conventions. And so you have them introduced and you can watch them and see how they were received and see how the people participated and what actually occurred at those events and activities related to that convention. So I've watched them from 1952 to 2020, which is the one that the Republicans had at the White House at that time. And now, of course, they've participated in some of these, but most recently, the one last, uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, there in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've not seen the energy, the enthusiasm, uh, the emotion, the engagement that you saw from the people that attended the one that nominated Donald Trump to be the 47th president of the United States. I'm used to conventions where they yell from the floor, more than one nominee, or they'll, they'll, it's not always 100% for that person. And it gets, uh, it gets really <laughs> awesome at times. People, I really, we've got 36 delegates, I give 26 to Mr. So-and-so and 10 to so-and-so. You see that? I mean, I, those are conventions. I mean, where there was competition. That's of, right. And uh, so that's what I was thinking about the Kamala Harris. Right. He, they didn't have a chance. Nobody, all those delegates that gave their de delegates to, to Joe Biden, they reached over here and took them. They don't care what you think. This is your delegate, but I'm giving it to Kamala Harris. Now, so be it. But that is no different than taking it and giving it to Donald Trump's people. That's right. Uh, you know, it's it's just undemocratic. How dare the Democrats do something undemocratic? Um, and I've got a lot of things I want to hit on here. Nikki Haley, did you see her? I did see Governor Haley. What was your thoughts on uh, her? I was glad out? that she chose to participate. I Me was too. even happier that President Trump invited her mm -hmm. to participate. I thought she gave an outstanding speech. Uh, she's a very gifted communicator and she did an outstanding job. And we are so appreciative of the outstanding job you do each and every week joining us here as we bring you another episode of Brainstorming America. We'll be back right after this break for the conclusion of the 67th episode of Brainstorming America. Welcome back to the last segment of uh, Brainstorming America. Uh, I'm Ken Rollins and uh, here with John Merrill. John, I've uh, got a few things I want to cover before we run out of time on this last segment. Um, so that Nikki Haley uh, gave her support to the Donald Trump during that convention and you were there. Uh, what do you think about having Haley on our side? Look, Governor Haley is an outstanding public servant. She did a great job in her roles in the South Carolina legislature. She did a great job as the governor of South Carolina. Uh, she was a tremendous asset to President Trump as the United States ambassador to the United Nations. One of the best. And I think that 
she would have probably been the vice presidential nominee if she had not pushed it so hard as she was trying to secure the Republican nomination for president in the 2024 cycle. But the president inviting her to come and to participate in the nomination process at the convention, she chose to accept that invitation. She gave an outstanding speech. She's a gifted communicator. Uh, she is great to have on President Trump's team as he moves forward for the 2024 election cycle. People need to remember that it was a, it is a competition when you're running for vice president or running for president. And just like you'd be playing football, you don't pull any punches. The things that you say, you try to hit the below the belt. You try to make that other person look bad while you look good. So keep that in mind. Politics are just politics. And so she did throw some pretty heavy stuff at Trump. But in the end, she came over to, I support him, because she, like me and John, she knows that this country is teeter-tottering on uh, being a, another country, a socialist country, or whatever, rather than what we used to. Uh, got some things I'm running out of time. J.D. Vance, what are your thoughts on him? I think that Senator Vance is a good selection. I think he will add to the president's agenda. Um, he will add a different type communication force than the president currently offers. Uh, I think he's very intelligent, very articulate. Uh, he comes from humble beginnings. Uh, he could have grown up over here in Iron City. Uh, he could have grown up over here by the mica mines in Cleveland County. He could have grown up over here um, next to the pipe shop. It's the kind of story which was revealed in his book that he wrote called Hillbilly Elegy, which became a film that Ron Howard actually produced that was very well received, made a ton of money, um, and resulted in his election to the United States Senate in 2022. He's been in office since January the 3rd, 2023. He is recognized as a great conservative voice in Washington, D.C. now as one of the 100, or now since Bob Menendez resigned, 99 senators in the United States Senate. And I think he's going to be a great addition to the ticket. What's your thoughts about seeing the Teamster president up there? Uh, I thought he did a great job. <laughs> I do now, too. There were a number of people that felt like he talked a little bit too long, but he did a great job in communicating the working man's perspective in the working man's support of Donald J. Trump. He got a lot of Democrats mad at him, he said. That was his words on another I'm sure TV show. He says, oh, my phone blew up. And they were not good calls, folks. He said, they, they a lot of people, he said, I felt threatened many times. And I look over my shoulders a lot now because of what I said. He said, I said what I thought. And sometimes that gets you in trouble. And uh, Secret Service on Rooftops. You've been on roof on the roof of your house, and they, they like this. That's right. And they, this one was about like that. That's right. They said they can't do. It. She said that they couldn't do that. What do you think? Oh, I think they can do whatever they want to do. <laughs> but and but I, on the I next think they did a poor job of being prepared for what they actually saw, and what actually happened. And I don't think that that will happen again anytime in the near future. But one of the things that we have to understand is that different people have different responsibilities whenever the president comes. And one of the things that Ken did in an earlier show is talk about the advance team and what they do and how they do their work. But it also should be noted that there are certain responsibilities that local and state law enforcement agencies also have in relationship to the Secret Service when they come to a particular community. And everybody has to do their job in order to make sure that everything goes right and well. And when there have been failures in the past, and we saw a failure, November 22nd, 1963, with the assassination of John F. Kennedy. We saw a failure, March 30th, 1981, in the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan when he was injured outside a hotel there in Washington, D.C. We saw another failure July the 6th, 2024, with the attempted assassination of Donald J. Trump. So we have to 
evaluate, assess uh, what has occurred, and then we have to make the appropriate changes as we move forward. Right. Well, right now, we don't need to get lax in our job. Uh, we need to keep, I say we, our country, our leadership needs to really pay attention right now because the Houthis are bombing Israel as we speak. And there's still a war going on. Uh, I, uh, Ukraine is still uh, on fire. And we have no leadership. Our president is MIA. So we know that, but so do the, our enemies, Iran especially. Uh, so I, I hope that our, our leaders out there are keeping their eye on the ball because we're in some really uh, precarious times right now. Would you agree? hundred percent. Okay. Um, something I want to ask you about. You're Caitlin Clark. Yes. You like basketball yourself. Yes. What do you think about Miss Caitlin? I think she's an exceptional athlete. I think she's an outstanding basketball player. And I think she's a great teammate and a great team leader. I watched her go from Iowa into the big league, the WNBA. Never watched a game in my life. Now I can't take my eyes off if it's on there right. because of her. Right. Not because of Angel Reese. Right. Not because of any of those other. And some of them, boy, they are really elbows to the face and hitting on the top of the head. They just really thugs, for lack of a better term. And they they try to beat her down, but she just keeps on, like the the bunny. She just keeps on going, and she has brought a whole basketball organization, not just her team. But uh, everybody, everybody up. and we hope that that's the way you feel each week after you join us for Brainstorm in America. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us again.